Oh man, I got an exciting story to tell you guys today. Spencer Rempel, the Moose Whisperer here, bringing you exciting hunting and outdoor adventure stories from around the world. And today's story is a trophy fishing story brought to you by me and starring my very own daughter, Brenna. Stick around to the end to hear more about this young, accomplished fisher girl. But for now, let's get right into the story. It was a nice, sunny, but cold November day. Winter fishing is the best on Kootenai Lake. That's usually when we catch the big ones, and that's what we were hoping for today. Although all the way up north in Canada, Kootenai Lake never freezes over. It is, in fact, one of the few lakes in Canada that never freezes over. And we're out fishing in November, as well as December or January, right from our boats. Well, I didn't own much of a boat, but like I always tell people, any boat is better than no boat. So I hooked on to my 14-foot StarCraft aluminum V-Hull that was outfitted with a Mercury 15 horsepower four-stroke, two rod holders, and a big tackle box. We also had very warm clothes, life jackets, and a little food. There's something so enjoyable about being out on the open water in Canada when everyone else is drilling holes in ice. <laughs> Kootenai Lake is almost 100 miles long and only half a mile wide. It has one main river flowing in and two outflows, and is 500 feet deep. I suppose those are some of the reasons it never freezes over, along with the milder temperatures, but still freezing temperatures, of the West Kootenays. Anyways, we drove the 10 minutes to the boat launch, launched our boat, and almost immediately started trolling for trout. That's how we fish for them here. Spoons, flashers, wet flies, plugs, downriggers, a lot like you would fish for salmon on the West Coast. And in fact, when you look around, unless you were to taste the water, you would think that you were on the West Coast in some beautiful inlet. But no, this is fresh water with the Purcell Mountains on one side and the Selkirks on the other, towering beautiful mountains that rise straight up out of the lake for over 7,000 feet. It's one beautiful place. The four-stroke motor fired up on the second pull just like it always did. And as soon as we got out of the bay, I kicked it down to an idle going two and a half to three miles per hour. We'd maintain that speed with a line on each side and hooks trailing back 75 to 125 feet. It would only take less than half an hour to get to the other side, straight across from our hometown of Caslow, British Columbia. That was our destination, a place they call the ink spots. A large, large cliffs go up hundreds of feet and these black markings that flow down them. As the cliffs meet the water, they continue straight down. And this being very close to shore has always been a hot spot. Oftentimes when arriving there, we would just troll back and forth, maybe a mile in each direction. Now Kootenai Lake is a fickle lake for fishing, let me tell you. That lake is hot and cold. I don't mean it warms up, it's cold all the time. I'm not talking temperature, I'm talking fish strikes, hot and cold. Some days you slay them, and other days, nothing. Heck, I've gone weeks on that lake without a bite. Stood up in my boat and swore this is the last time I'll ever waste time out here freezing to death for no fish. There's not a damn fish in this lake! I'd shake my fist at the sky in frustration, and then all of a sudden, zoo! you'd hear that sound. You'd hear the line go and sing the most beautiful sound a fisherman can hear. When a 15 or 18 pound rainbow trout grabs your hook and makes a run for it, oh, that'll keep you fishing through any dry spell. <laughs> we set our drag loose because trout fight hard and you don't want them to rip that hook right out of their mouth. So you gotta go easy. There's no winching them in. You gotta fight them but it takes some time and skill to make sure there's, there's never any slack in your line. You see, on that lake, it's no barbs allowed. Here in Canada, fishing regulations vary from lake to lake, or even from area to area. For example, the regulations for this lake was no barbed hooks and no bait. Okay, back to the story. We made it to the other side of the lake, and we're just coming around our second pass beside the cliffs, when my daughter says, oh! Oh, I got one, Daddy! <laughs> I seen the rod dip hard, and I thought to myself, she's got a pretty decent fish on there. She was reeling, and she was reeling in and doing a really good job, 
But when the fish got close to the boat, it started to pull really hard. I can't do it. It's too hard, Brenna cried out to me. I knew she had a good fish on there, and I thought perhaps it was a 8 to 10 pounder, which would really be an accomplishment for a small 11-year-old girl to reel in and catch entirely by herself. I can't do it. My arm, my arm, she cried out as she switched hands and tried to reel with her left. No, no, don't do that, I said. Keep it in your right hand and just keep reeling. <laughs> don't let it get slack. You can do it. That's why they call it a fight, <laughs> I replied loudly, encouraging her. She'd been reeling a while when that fish finally came to the surface and I got my first look at it. Oh my God, I thought, that's a big one. And I suddenly realized why she was complaining so much. The temptation came over me to grab that rod and take over. For that fish looked like an absolute trophy. And I didn't want it to get away. But I knew, I knew if that little girl could, could get it in herself, this was going to create a moment of pride and joy almost like no other. And I wasn't going to take that away from her. With her tired arms, no barb on the hook, I was really taking a chance that that fish would get away. You can do it, honey. Just keep on reeling. Don't give up, I encouraged her. Well, that little girl's got grit. And that fish drug out more line that she would have to reel in. She kept on going and never asked me to take over again. My heart swelled with joy and pride. You got to understand, we, we got all our winter clothes on, big gloves and everything, and she just continued to suck that rod in under her arm and keep on reeling. And she brought that fish right back to the boat. Oh, okay, now's my chance to net it. But you got to be careful. A lot of fish get lost right at netting time. If the fish has too much energy and too much strength left in it, it can freak out from seeing the boat, the people, the net, and use all the remainder of its energy to flip and roll and splash and spit the hook. You want that fish tired, really tired, just barely moving, up, just barely moving alongside your boat as you dip your net into the water and bring them up in one fell swoop. <laughs> Well, as you can see behind me, I had been videotaping the entire thing. Handing the poor quality cell phone camera over to Brenna, hey, it was 2011, I prepared to lift the biggest bull trout I'd ever seen. I can't! It was an absolute monster. 21 pounds, the fattest fish I'd ever seen and much bigger than any trout I'd ever caught in that lake. A record she still holds with extreme pride and finds it very enjoyable to remind me. <laughs> now I grew up on Kootenai Lake and I lived there fishing that lake for 30 years and I have never seen anyone catch a bigger bull trout than this. It's worth mentioning that bull trout is a species of that fish, although locals have nicknamed them dollies. I think that terminology must have come from ocean fishermen who fished, first fished in the lake. Like I said, the biggest bull trout, dolly, I've ever seen. What's your biggest bull trout you've ever seen? Let me know in the comments below. Am I wrong? Is it huge? Do they get even bigger? <laughs> what are they like where you fish? I'd love to know. Well, back to our story. It was a Sunday afternoon at about 1 p.m. at this point, and Brenna and I made haste to the opposite shore where our truck waited. We knew if we hurried, we'd be just in time for church getting out and be able to show off to all our friends and most importantly, to her grandma and grandpa. <laughs> yes, we skipped church to go fishing. Sorry to say, but no, no, I'm not sorry to say. <laughs> we were blessed. God blessed us that day. What a wonderful father-daughter time it was. My daughter still tells this story to all who will listen. I still see her smile and her face light up with pride from her accomplishment. I'm so glad I didn't take that rod away, and this turned out to be a father's best day. Like I said, she always rubs it in that she caught a bigger fish than me, but I wouldn't have it any other way. Good job, Brenna. I love you. Well, that, was, that year was 2011, and Brenna was 11 years old. 
so you can guess that today she's turning 24. She never stopped fishing and loves it even today. When she was 12, I took the whole family to Belize for the winter. Well, that's a whole nother story. And Brina spent most of the time in the water, snorkeling and spear fishing. She still fishes Kootenai Lake today, with bull trout and rainbow trout being her favorite. But I doubt she'll ever beat that record of 21 pounds. Maybe her and I can go to the ocean one day and catch some big fish there, or a sturgeon in the Fraser River. It's a wonderful thing when fishing can bring you close to your family and give you meaningful memories like I have with my children. Thanks for watching, folks. That's my story, and I'd like to tell yours. Send in your stories to info at themoosewhisperer.com. Thanks for watching, folks, and hey, more stories to come.